So I'm going to talk about worm control, uh, cattle, helmet parasites. I'm going to talk about worms. Now, if you've got questions about ectoparasites, Dr. Uh, Tucker came with me. He's our uh, veterinary entomologist in the department, so he can ask questions about flies and unimportant parasites like that. I'm going to talk about the worms here in my presentation. Okay, a more important title for this presentation, it's a great time to be a parasite. Uh, like what I've said, you know, the medications have stayed the same for 30 years, and uh, the worms, uh, they're happy to see it that way. And also, what got it done in the past does not get it done today. What you used to do for worm control does not give you the same control today. And I'm not telling you guys anything new. I'm sure you've been noticing the, the lack of efficacy we're getting with products today. And history repeats itself again. So every time you treat for parasites, you select for the resistant ones, you kill the easy ones. So every time you use products, history repeats itself on your operation. OK, uh, the question is, do you lose two parasites? No, the better question is how much do you lose? There is no way that you are going to get all the parasites out of your cattle. You have to live with parasites. Unless you start treating those cows like cage laying hens, that's the only way you're going to get away from worms. The worms and the environment and the cattle, they're all in a cycle, and they use that cycle 365 days a year. We don't ever get out of good transmission of parasites in Arkansas. That's why the parasites and livestock love it in the southeast United States. They have the right temperature, the right moisture. They love it here. Here's the worms that we have. Cattle, sheep, horses. Uh, horses, I'm not going to talk about these other critters. The only good thing about horses is they're parasites. They got fantastic parasites, but that's another talk altogether. Uh, sheep and goats, they got a selection of, of worms. Cattle worms, and these are the most important worms. We've got round worms, we've got tape worms, we've got flat worms or flutes. Insects, or several insects are important, and a few protozoa. I'm going to just be talking about the nematodes, the round worms. Those are the ones that are most important in raising cattle uh, economically in Arkansas. And as to how important they are, all five of these can kill your cattle, every one of them. Some of them like the young cattle, some of them like the older cattle, some of them like the cattle in, in the middle, some of them get resistant, some don't. They all do something special. And they all do something that makes them successful. And they were here thousands of years ago, and they'll be here a long time after we're gone. They're extremely successful critters. Parasites. We don't have to worry about losing them. You don't have to put any of these on the endangered species list. They will be here, no problem. And they all, it looks like they all have mechanisms to become resistant to whatever we come up with. Everything we've had so far relative to drugs, parasites have an innate ability somewhere encoded in their genes to get resistant to it. Okay, there's selection for resistance that they're all capable of. The most important worm, this Hymongus, the barber pole worm, they feel that worm has more genetic potential to become resistant to anything than any other organism on this planet. A worm, that, that much DNA capability. Incredible how important these parasites are and how able they are. Um, okay, that's it for that. Uh, the nematode parasites, what makes them successful? I figure that one 400 pound calf out there with a low level of parasite a count will contribute to your pasture 100,000 new worms each day. Each day, worms on the grass. I'm not talking eggs going out in the manure and, and staying in the manure. I'm talking about worms completely successfully going from the feces through the dung paddy up onto the grass and waiting for another cow to eat it. Each calf you get out there, 100,000 new worms are added to that pasture looking to get eaten by a herbivore. So there's a numbers game, fecundity, reproduction, survival. On pasture, these worms are protected by the dung, by the dung paddy. I don't care how hot and dry you get it out there, for how long you can have live worms under that dung paddy in the ground. All they need is a, just a little bit of moisture that they can get to, they will survive. They are protected with a sheath or a shell on the egg. They resist drying. They resist cold. They are motile. They move like fish. 
a little bit of water, they go where they're supposed to go on the pasture. They try to succeed on that pasture. In the animal, they arrest with season, like woodchucks. Okay, when seasons are bad, they hibernate in the animal. When seasons are good, they come out of their hibernation. The most important worms do that. Interbird and arrestment. They can tell when other worms of the same species are in high populations. So they cut down their reproduction, kind of like rats and mice in that, re that regard. They cut down their populations. They cut down their reproduction. When they find out that worms of their same species are lacking in numbers in the animals, they increase their reproduction. They're always looking to survive in their environment. Sequestration. They get away. They hide from the immune response of the animal. They hide from where drugs get to. Okay? They make themselves inaccessible to how they can be controlled by the animal or by drugs. Resistance. They all develop resistance to drugs. Staying non-clinical. That's probably one of the most important factors. You, you, for every animal you get out there, you probably get about 100,000 worms. If they're on the outside, you would see them and you'd get rid of them. But they're inside, they're not acutely visible to you, their detriment to that animal is not visible to you, hence they get along just perfectly fine. I think people that smoke, if their lungs were on the outside and you could see how rotten and disgusting the lungs got, they'd stop smoking. But they're inside, kind of hide, you can get away with smoking for years and years and years until you can't, stuff like that. They hide, they stay non-clinical, worms stay non-clinical, they're subclinical, they just rob you a little bit per animal every day. They don't kill your animals like bacteria and viruses and coyotes and rattlesnakes, stuff like that. They just take away from the productivity of the animal. And compensatory responsiveness, they can tell when their numbers get buffed up or don't need to get buffed up, and they respond accordingly. They're very smart critters that don't have a brain, but extremely smart. Okay, the pathogenesis of the helmets of the worms, what do they do? They decrease appetite, anorexia. That's the first thing they do. They decrease appetite. You get 100,000 worms in there, you wouldn't feel too much like eating. So they decrease how much the animal eats. Plus, whatever that animal eats, the intestinal tract doesn't get to use it as well because that whole intestinal tract is being inhabited by worms living in the tissue of that intestinal tract. If you have that many worms living in the tissue, obviously that tissue is not going to work. So the animal doesn't eat as much, what it does eat is used less effectively by the animal. Blood and tissue loss. All these worms, all those round worms, they don't eat the diet of the animal. What goes through the intestinal tract. All of those worms eat the animal. They eat the blood, they eat the tissue, they eat the fluids of the animal. Tapeworms, they're not too clinical in cattle. They just lay in the intestinal tract and absorb their nutrients from the diet of the animal. Tapeworms are the only, the, the only uh, exception to the rule. The rest of these worms eat the animal. All of their growth is from the animal. Uh, redu uh, reduce productivity. I don't care what you have your animal doing, reproducing, milking, growing, whatever, it does less of that because of the worms that are in it. Introduction of secondary pathogens. All these worms cause little holes in the intestinal tract, plus cause the circulatory system not to work as well. Hence, they're allowing opportunist pathogens to get from that intestinal tract into the animal. Not only do, do, the, do they do that, worms cause a reduced or redirected immune response. With all those worms in the intestinal tract, the immune system has to face all those worms and is faced with an assault of all that foreign material. Now, the immune system can't cut itself off and think, oh, those are just worms, we're, just, we're not going to mess with them. So instead, the immune system has to respond to those worms. It has a shift in the immune system. You go from a T1 to a T2 immune response. So your immune system of the animal gets geared for a whole bunch of hormones and, and, re, and forgets about the part of the immune system that requires immune cells. So a cow that has an awful lot of worms is not as responsive to vaccines, is not as responsive to, to, to viruses as it would be if the worms weren't there. And that's been shown several times in several research projects. Reduce drug and vaccine deficiencies. Whatever you use is not going to be worked as well in an animal that's got worms in it. Good. So that's what the worms are doing in there. This is a study that was done in sheep. And we can do the same thing in cattle, horses, pigs, chickens, turkeys. 
when you add worms to the intestinal tract, that intestinal tract swells up because of inflammation and inflammatory response. Worms in the intestinal tract is the same thing as an allergy to your nose. All that inflammation, all that excessive circulation and dilation of capillaries, the same thing is happening when you add worms to the intestinal tract. In this particular study, they added worms to, to uh, the sheep. The abomasum, the four stomach, grew close to 20% because of non-clinical amount of worms that were in it. The small intestine grew 60%. Increased dilation, increased inflammation in the intestinal tract because worms are in it. The large intestine grew 50%. That is total tissue development just due to inflammation and immune response because worms were added. With all that happening in the intestinal tract, digestion is getting suffered because of that. Here's a study done in about 19, uh, 2000. You can do the same thing today, get the same results. These are cattle coming to the feed yard. And they were either treated on pasture before feed yard or, feeded, or, or treated for worms at feed yard. The ones that weren't treated for worms before they showed at the feed yard and also were not treated for worms when they entered feed yard, they had to pull 14% of those calves during 120 days for diseases, for disease control. Not worm control, for disease control. The ones that were treated on, on arrival to the feed yard but not on pasture before the feed yard, 8% of those had to get pulled. The ones that were treated at pasture but not at feed yard, 4% had to get pulled. The ones that were treated for worms during pasture before feed yard and as they entered feed yard, only 2.5%. The more worms you have, the more disease that animal cannot deal with. That happens in the feed yard, it happens on your pastures also. More worms, the less well the animals do against other diseases. Here's a life cycle of the, of the common worms that we're dealing with in this state and others. The worms are in the, in the animal, eggs come out into feces. In the feces, if the temperature is good like this from between now and September, you go from the egg to the first stage larvae, to the second stage larvae, to the third stage larvae in a week. That third stage larvae cannot eat all these other stages, the first stage and the second stage, they eat the feces and the bacteria and the, the dissolved organic matter in the feces. Once they become an infective larvae, they have a sheath, a protective sheath on them. They can't eat from the feces anymore, and they realize that. If they can migrate out of that feces, if the feces is still moist and malleable, they will migrate out of the feces up to about a yard, yard and a half away, and then get the grass and go up and down on that grass depending on moisture. If there's moisture, they're up on the grass. If the grass is dry, they stay down in the soil. They keep that up for about three months, hoping in that three-month period of time they get eaten. So they get eaten, get into the animal. The small intestine worms go to the small intestine. The large intestine worms go to the large intestine. The abomasal worms stop in the abomasum. The lung worms, they go to the lungs. Everybody knows where they're supposed to go. No brains, no road signs, no GPSs. They all go to where they're supposed to go. They find their mates, and the whole thing starts all over again. You have some females that produce 50 eggs per female per day. You have some meat females that produce 2,000 eggs per female per day. You have a whole bunch of new worms coming out of these animals. Generally speaking, I've already mentioned about 100,000. That, that's a normal level of worms we have in a stalker-type animal, about 100,000 worms. And a little bit less than that in adult cattle, and a little bit less than that in, in suckling calves. But that's right around the level. You can have anywhere from 50 worms up to a million worms, depending on which worms you've got in abundance on your farm and a season of year. Okay, so that's the life cycle of the worms. This is what the eggs look like that come out in the feces. That's a whipworm egg. That's a coxiosis right there. That's a strongyle egg. I'll get back to that. That's a hookworm egg. Cattle have hookworms. That life cycle showed that the larvae get on the grass and then get eaten, get into the animal. We have three worms that don't need that. They can be on the grass, and if the animal steps on them or lays on them, that larvae will migrate through the skin into the bloodstream and get carried to various parts of the body. The thread worm does that. This worm does that. The hook worm does that. And the nut, oh, let's go back here. 
and the, uh, the nodular worm does that. So three worms can get in that way also. That's a tapeworm egg. It's another coxiosis. That's a treadworm egg. Beautiful, beautiful worm, beautiful egg. Kind of looks like a football with brown marshmallows in it. And it's, uh, that, that, that worm is called nematodirus. It will only infect cattle less than about 12, 13, 14 months of age. Once a cow gets older than that, it won't touch that animal. It just stays at the, the lower age of the, yeah. Don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. They, they can migrate into your skin, but they die in your skin. They cannot, they cannot infect a horse. Can't. And they're nowhere near as bad as worms you get from cats and dogs that can migrate in your skin. Okay, nowhere near as bad. But they can migrate in your skin and die. I told you not to worry about that. They have fantastic life cycles. My students hate them in parasitology class because they all have different life cycles, and I can dock them a lot of points on exams. It's, wor it's worms that do the exceptional things that students hate. So don't worry about them. They're not, they're not important worms. In cattle, they can be important. Their, their cousins are important in dogs and cats and uh, in us. And that's about it. Not in horses. Yeah. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'm, I'm setting the stage. I'm setting the stage for all this depressing stuff about when to treat and when not to treat and how lousy treatment's going to be regardless of when you do it. Okay? You're already depressed and I haven't even gotten to the depressing part of the talk yet. <laughs> okay, so those are the, that's what floats in the feces. Now this egg right here, that has, that's the same egg that comes out of five of the most important worms. They all lay basically the same kind of egg. So what we do is we take, we do the egg count, we find out who's in, who's in the animal via the egg count, and then we grow these eggs into larvae so we can tell exactly which of this genera of the important worms are in those animals. And this is what, this is what we get out of the egg as a third stage larvae. And when we, we tell them apart by their tails. That's a, a trichostrongulus, ostrichia, the brown stomach worm. That's a small stomach worm. That's a brown stomach worm. These are the cuperiids. Whoop, back up here again. Whoop. Those are the cuperiids. These are the most important ones in stalker calves. These are the ones that are most resistant to the drugs we have today. Here's Hyboncus, the most important worm in sheep. And as you go closer to Texas, it gets really important in cattle, too. And here's uh, the nodular worm. So that's what the eggs look like, uh, but larvae, tails look like. This is the larvae that leaves the feces. That's just their tails, and they crawl up and down on the grass. Very active. That's how big that third stage larvae is when it gets eaten by the animal. That's what it grows into in four weeks. Four weeks, 28 days. About 500 times the size. All of that size is animal you don't get, plus a whole bunch of inflammation in that intestinal tract. Here's a, some pictures of some of the worms we have in, in all of your cattle. That's a brown stomach worm. Those are the cuperiids. It's the great looking worms. They really are. There ought to be calendars with all these pictures on. That's a barber pole worm. Those are hook worms. That's a big mouth right there from, for sucking blood and eating tissue. That's the whip worm. That's the whip worm of cattle. That's, it's called a whipworm. It should be called a neckworm because that's its neck. Here's its tail. That's the tail of a male, tail of a female. My thumb is too big for this. And that whole neck is what it threads into the intestinal lining in the cecum and holds itself in place. Very important worm in dogs, the, the first cousin of this worm. Whipworms are very important in dogs. They're hard to kill because they hold on. Most of the drugs you give to cattle in any animal for, for killing worms, all they do is knock that worm out for a short period of time. And in that period of time when the worm is knocked out, it can't use its muscles, it gets carried away from where it's supposed to be in the intestinal tract to a place where it's not supposed to be and it dies. You take an abomasal worm, you move it to the small intestine, it's a dead worm. You take a small intestine worm, you move it to the large intestine, it's dead. Okay, it just like knocks it out just a little bit. Whipworms, they hook on, so it's awful hard to kill. I told you how worms 
jive the immune system of animal. This worm, or the first cousin, its first cousin in the pig, is being used in clinical studies in England, infecting people with non-responsive <coughs> inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, and autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease. They're infecting people with that pig worm, the pig whipworm, and it's <coughs> knocking out the inflammatory nature of their intestinal tract, getting an 80% cure rate of people with worms. The only downside is you have to give those people new worms every three months. But the bright side is you're curing people with worms. And I can, I can talk for hours on what worms do to the immune system. Okay, here's the fluke. You only have flukes where you have animals eating grass that sticks out of water. That's the only way you're going to get flukes. Okay, so if you have that sort of a scenario in your pastures, you should worry a little bit about flukes. Okay, if you don't have animals eating a bunch of water that has extended out of standing water, eating grass that has extended out of standing water, you don't need to worry about flukes. And if you did worry about flukes, drugs are less effective against flukes than they are against the rest of the worms, and not effective against the rest of the worms. So, you know, why worry about something you can't do anything about? Here's what a fluke looks like. Good looking worm. Here's the tapeworm life cycle. Tapeworm life cycle, the tapeworm lays in the intestinal tract, eggs come out, free living mites eat it. The cow eats a free living mite with the infective stage of the tapeworm, and the whole thing starts all over again. And that's a tapeworm from one animal, one, intest one intestinal tract. Good looking worm. Okay, the drugs we have, levamazole. People got away from that. Okay, it wasn't all that good 30 years ago. And the benzimidazoles came out, and the, uh, the uh, macrocystic lactones came out, so people stopped using it. Now it perhaps has a new place to deal with the resistance that we have. You know, it's a, it's a spot on sort of a deal where you use it. I recommend it in sheep and goat production, and every so often in cattle production, depending on how resistant your worms are. Levamazole. So it might it might be having a new a new lease on life. Levamazole. The benzimidazoles, fenbenazole, oxfenazole, albenazole, these two are basically the same, fenbenazole and oxfenazole. The animal metabolizes each of them into the other when you give it to the animal. Uh, I've shown that oxfenazole, which is synanthic, is a little bit more efficacious than fenbenazole, which is a uh, safeguard, because it's more soluble, it just get, it gets to the worm quicker. Albenazole, extremely soluble. And you give that at higher dose levels, that, that also gets the, the worms that are ground worms, and it gets the flukes also. Only adult flukes. The macrocyclic lactones, the avermectin macrocyclic lactones, or ivermectin, that came out in 1982. Doramectin came out about two years later. Epinomectin came out a few years after that. They're basically the same molecule, just a very little bit of difference. Those are macrocyclic lactones. We have pioneer and generic preparations of ivermectin. All the work, or the majority of the work that I've done, shows that the pioneer, the trade name, is more efficacious than the generic. Uh, the topical and injectable formulations, there's a whole bunch of discussion as to which is more efficacious there. It looks like if you do a good job of treatment and you make sure all of that treatment gets on that animal, and it's not wet and covered with feces and mud and everything that the pour on is probably more efficacious than the injectable. Plus it'll work a little bit better for ectoparasites. But you have to make sure the treatment is right. Okay, it's not a splash on or a shoot in that direction on. Okay, it's a pour on. It's supposed to stay on that animal. Macrocytic lactone resistant strains of cuperia, haemonchus, and perhaps ostatajo. A prinomectin just came out in a long range injection. Long range injection. So after 30 years of worms getting resistant to that molecule, Muriel comes out with a long acting formulation of it. Something doesn't seem to jive. Okay, our recommendations are, well, well take that. my recommendations are, if you're gonna use long range, you use it, and then check your egg counts 30 days later. If you got eggs coming out of those animals, those eggs, are going to become worms that are highly, highly, highly resistant to ivermectin, doramectin, aprinomectin, and probably a lot of cydectin. So if you want to seed your places down 
with generations of worms that are resistant to all the mectins, go ahead and use it and don't watch how well it's doing. Okay? So if you're using it, there could be a lot of benefit there, but be, be warned. Okay? You're selecting for resistance every day for 100 days. You're selecting for resistance. That's my spiel on that. Uh, the other maxotic lactone we have is milbamycin. It's more efficacious than, than those other ones. Ivermectin, Doramectin, and Aprinomectin, it's more efficacious. Topical injectable. There is still resistance to it, but not as bad. And you have chlorcelon, which is combined with some of the MLs for uh, plus preparations for, for, t uh, for treatment toes. So those are the products we have. Reasons for the failure of the parasiticides on your farm? Well, malpractices, wrong dose rate. You look on the label of all these drugs, it's so many milliliters or so many grams or milligrams per kilogram of animal. That's important. That's really important. If you underdose by just a little bit, you're just making those worms a little bit sick. You ain't killing anybody. You're having a hard time killing anybody at the right dose. If you use the wrong dose, you underdose, you are, you're wasting all of that dose. You just wasted it. Plus, you've really stirred that resistance factor. So make sure you're at least given the recommended milligrams per kilogram, which means weigh the animal or weigh the heaviest animal and then treat everybody accordingly. Don't underdose. Okay? Uh, wrong time for treatment. You don't want to treat for worms in the middle of winter. You don't want to treat for worms in the middle of summer. Because during those two periods of time, those animals are not getting reinfected. So you're going to kill the worms that are easy to kill, and you're going to leave that animal with all the resistant worms. And you're not going to have new worms coming into that animal that dilute that resistance pool. Okay? If you got resistant worms in there, okay, in the animal. If you get non-selected worms in there to mate with the resistant ones, you dilute your resistance. Middle of winter, middle of summer, your challenge from your pasture is very small, so the resistant worms you're left with, they produce resistant eggs, and when weather gets better, then all those resistant eggs turn into resistant larvae, which turns into resistant worms. Okay, you want a worm when you're sure you're going to get some cycling of worms back into that animal. Okay? Uh, okay, too much treatment. You want to, well, and I, you know, I put that there, but I don't know what too much treatment is. When you, when you treat more often than every three months, then you're, you're cleaning all the susceptible worms out of your animal, and you're just concentrating the resistant worms in there, okay? And sometimes you have to do that in stalker operations. And stalker operations, boy, I wouldn't wish that on anybody unless you want to grow resistant worms. Because that is the hardest facet of, of cattle production relative to resistance of worms that there is, is a stalker operation. So we're, we're just giving too much treatment out there. And we're just selected for resistance. Inaccurate treatments, topicals. Topicals are, are, the, are, the, are the ones most misused because people tend to splash as opposed to really treat. The drenches down the mouth, those, that's a real specific treatment. The injectables really measured and specific. You know everything was there and then there. Porons, it, too much gets lost. Doesn't get to the worm. Plus, nothing about porons. When you pour on a macrocytic lactone, only about 15 to 20% of that drug reaches the worm. I don't even, I, even when you do a fantastic job, if you pour that animal, only 15 to 20 percent of that drug gets to the worm. If you let that animal lick itself and it gets some of that drug down the mouth, then you, you've got it up to about 30, 40, 50 percent of the drug gets to the worm. Injectable, 30, 40, 50 percent. Oral, 50 percent of the drug gets to the worm. Okay, product problems. Head or tail selection. Head selection means you give a product and it kills the easy worms and leaves the hard ones alone. And it happens, that's head selection. Tail selection, when you use a macrocytic lactone, when you use ivermectin, when you use a printomectin, doramectin, cydectin, you treat them today, 90 days from now, that worm can still detect that drug in that animal. So 90 days from now, that drug is still in that animal selecting for resistant stages. That's tail selection. We thought that was fantastic. 
when it came out in the 80s. We get a drug we give today, and that animal's protected for 60 days. Well, after a few years, well, it's protected for 40 days. After a few years, well, it's protected for a week. After a few more years, it ain't protected one little bit because of resistance, because of that tail of the drug. You give a benzamidazole, a white dewormer, it's in them today. You can give that animal a brand new batch of worms three days from now. And there ain't any drug left in that animal. So you only get the head selection, not the tail selection. And if we, if we could do it again, that's the way we should make products that are used then and they're out of the animal. They don't select for resistance from that point on. Okay, uh, animal to animal variations, the biological availability. The more fat an animal, the less the aprinomectins, the ivermectins, the dormectins work because they get tied up in the fat. Okay, the fat. Individual. There is an individual, individual variation as to how much drug gets to the worm because of molecular uh, uh, pathways. Diet. The wetter your diet, the more fluid your diet, the less drug gets to the worms. The drier your diet, the more drug gets to your worm. Sex. Males do not let as much drug get to the worms as females do. Females put a lot more drug to the worms than males do. Plus, males get more worms than females do. Bulls always have more worms than, than, the, than the females do. Because the, the, the male immune system at the gut is nowhere near as good as the female immune system at the gut. Worm behavioral abilities, it looks like, it looks like with resistance, we also have a more active worm, a more hungry worm. Worms have decided, okay, this drug's going to knock out 30% of my ability to, to eat. I'm going to eat 30% more than I need to. That's what it looks like has happened with the cuperiates, the ones that are most resistant to the drugs. They're more active. They're more hungry so that when the drug knocks out a little bit of their activity, a little bit of their hunger, they still have enough going on so that they stay in the animal. And we found that out in the 90s, that that's what was going on, 1990s. Uh, molecular changes. When, the way I can really impress you with that, when ivermectin first came out, if your neighbor's collie was getting on your farm, you give it just a little bit of ivermectin, it's dead. It wouldn't make it to the border of your property and the, animal, and the property next to it. Because small, uh, small collies, short-haired collies, don't have a system in their cells to kick out macrocyclic lactose called the PGP, P-glycoprotein system. And that's why they were so susceptible to the drug. And there's a couple of breeds of cattle that are like that. We don't have any United States or over in Europe. Worms use that. They use that system to recognize the drug and kick it out of themselves. Okay? What the collies didn't have, worms have that system. And they've really enlarged that system. Is that me? Am I vibrating like that? We well, got somebody who knows what's going on here. Maybe I should step back on, on the outside of the deck. Okay. Okay, so that's what worms are doing. The worms that are resistant, they use this system to kick the drug out of their, of their bodies. Plus, they change the attachment sites of the drug. So they are actively making themselves less responsive to the drug. Okay? That's what uh, enables their resistance. No. Maybe on this side. Are you sure it's me doing it? Okay, I'll go over here anyway. Okay, my current recommendation, stalker animals, when do you treat? When you get them, and then depending on what their egg counts are and how well your drug did, and your interpretation of how well they did, you retreat them, okay? Are receiving medication different from your, your repeat medication? And it looks like, due to how well the worms are doing and how much resistance out there, it looks like a combination on re receiving is probably the best way to go. Get all the resistant worms that you can out of the animals before you put it on your pasture and get your pasture seated down with the worms that are resistant all the way along that stalker animal's trek to your operation. Replacement, spring and fall. Worms need spring and fall. That's when you knock them down with a treatment it's also a period of time when resistant worms get diluted with new worms coming in from pasture. Cows, I recommend only right around calving. It's the only time you treat a cow for worms. It's doing well. It's resistant to the majority of the worms. And it looks like you're going to get your money back only 
if you get that mama cow to produce more milk and cycle better. Produce more milk, bigger calf, better calf, stronger calf, you get the money back that way. Plus, worm her out when she, when she calves, she'll cycle better and you'll, and you'll catch her better. Okay, worm her out right around calving. I, I recommend within about a month of calving, before calving. That's the best time to do it. Gave that recommendation in Florida, and a guy stopped me. He said, wait a second. He said, bring the cows up and treat them about a month before calving. It takes us three months to bring up our mama cows in northern Florida. There's some places that, that run 100,000 mama cows. I said, well, that's your problem. No. <laughs> I'm only telling you what the worms and the cows need. Okay, calves, sometimes when they're still nursing, sometimes for the most part, that's a pretty standard recommendation. When you wean them, uh, very few farms, they don't even have enough worms when you wean them to warrant treatment. So it really depends on how wormy they get, and you find that out by doing egg counts. And that's what we're there for. You want egg counts done? Get your extension agent, send us the feces, we'll tell you what kind of eggs you got. Okay, that's what we're there for. We're there for a few other things like teaching and going to football games and stuff like that. But we'll, we'll do fecal samples. Uh, feedlot, we don't worry about that here, but you want to treat them out when you get them and that's it. Okay, a few studies we've done up the road. Uh, Fayetteville, uh, this was done about four or five years ago, Jeremy Powell did this. We started with the best looking replacement Angus heifers in the state. I mean, these guys were fantastic looking. We treated them twice with side acting, long acting when we got them, or Ivomec Plus when we got them. And then again, um, about 90 days later, and we had a control group. We grew them for 400 days, we bred them, we calved them out, and then we weaned their calves. It was a two year study looking at how well that dewormer worked eventually all the way through until that was re reproducing mama cow, okay? The receiving, the replacement heifer treatment, how well it worked. So we got them at day zero, we treated them with long-acting cydectin, Ivomec Plus, control, and here's their eight counts. We did a pretty good job of decreasing eight counts. Eventually, with enough resistance in these animals, we didn't have eight counts in anybody. But the effects of worms are long-lasting. What a worm load does to an animal today is still detracting from its performance a year later. These effects are long-lasting in these animals. And here is a total gain with the long-acting cydectin versus the ibomec versus the control. The more worm control we gave them, the better they gain. But the, but the backside here is, you looked at any of these animals, even the controls, you would swear there wasn't a worm in those animals. They were so fantastic in what they looked like. And they looked better than 99% of the other replacement heifers in the state. And still we had a significant improvement in how well they did, depending on if we took care of worms or not. Incredible. That, that's the big story. That's the rest of the story. Paul Harvey, that, that is the rest of the story. These animals look fantastic, and yet, measurable, even to a statistician, measurable improvement in animal performance. In the conception rates, we control their worms, 80% conception rate, natural, in 60 days. Controls, 70%. Fantastic looking animal. A depression in, in, in fertility because of, because of insignificant level of worms. And then we, 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 we birthed these uh, heifers out. The more worm control we had in them as replacements, the bigger their calves were. Plus, the bigger they were when they were weaned because of what was done 400 days earlier as a replacement heifer. Fantastic study. I wish I had more to do with it, but Jeremy Powell did that work. Tucker did a lot of that work. We, we, did, it, we did a lot of that work. Too. Okay, okay th this is, now we get to the depressing stuff. 2012, we did a fecal egg count reduction study. Calves, Tucker calves coming in from Florida. Treated them with Ivomec Plus at arrival to the stock of reference in Arkansas, and then we got them at the U of A. And what we did there, we used a generic poron or a generic injectable. Two different sets of calves, Ivomec poron or Ivomec injectable, Cydectin poron or injectable, safeguard by itself, drench it, drench it, so then you got it. People always ask me, how about this free choice business and blocks, stuff like that? Great if, if the animals eat the, the recommended amount of drugs, but you have to make sure they eat it all. 
If they don't, if they don't, then you then you get animals that aren't getting treated when you put blocks out there or feed top dress. And the other treatment groups were the drugs combined with the safeguard, which is what I recommend with, with receiving stalker animals. The, the porons and then the injectables. Okay, <clears throat> well, that's a little bit more what we did. Now here is the poron group. The control egg counts went down 19%. The ones we poured with the generic, their egg counts went up 7%. Okay, that's not unusual for us to see that. Ivomec poron, only 60% reduction in egg count. You, in order to get a drug passed through the FDA, you have to have at least a 90% reduction. Okay, so Ivomec didn't, didn't cut it. Obviously, the, the Normec, the generic didn't cut it. The Cydectin poron did 90%, Safeguard 90%. When you combine them, they all did well. That's basically a reflection of the Safeguard. And, and, and really, you can't, you can't 100% use a fecal egg count reduction test to tell how well the white dewormers work because the white dewormers only kill the adult animal, the worms. They don't kill the inhibited worms. So you can have an animal with 50,000 adult worms and the white deworm will kill that, but the 100,000 inhibited worms, they'll just bounce off of those. And they'll come out of that inhibition three, days, three, three months down the road and wreck the heck out of your animal. You don't use white dewormers in Arkansas from May through September because the brown stomach worm is highly inhibited during that time frame. Only the macrocytic lactones will kill the inhibited brown stomach worm. Okay? So that's the poron, the injectable, the controls did go up. Normectin injectable, 18%, 20% for the Ivomec. Cydectin injectable didn't do well. That is, that's the poorest I have ever seen Cydectin do in Arkansas. It's always above 90%. Something happened with this set of calves. Just didn't. And that, that, judging from the other 30 studies I've done with Cydectin, this is a fluke here. Stuff is usually really, really good. And the safeguard and the combinations did, did really good. But here again, we're not looking at inhibited stages, only the egg laying stages. That's that group. Now here's, and, and that's stalker animals. So they've come from wherever they came from. They've been pastured with other animals, treated repeatedly, shared resistant worms with everybody from Florida all the way up to Arkansas. So your stalker animals, they are a sponge for resistant stages. So your drug's gonna work less well there than anywhere else. But how about if you take that wean calf that doesn't have the resistant worms in it yet? It's coming off of mama cow. Mama cow doesn't have resistant worms in it yet. Because we're not using that much drug in the mama cow. So let's take a look at these calves. So this is what we did here. This is efficacies uh, for, the, for the products in calves freshly weaned. They're still balling when we brought them into the study. Well, let me get back. These worms for Hymonchus, which is the barber pole worm, the small stomach worm, for the brown stomach worm, for the nodular worm, it didn't matter what you had, the generic or cydectin, the drugs work great because there's no resistance there yet. And also for the really resistant worms, the cuperius, all drugs basically, the poron did really well, and then the, the generic let one of the species through and the injectable let the other species through. So we had a little bit of resistance in the cuperia. But generally, it worked pretty well. The drugs worked pretty well when you got the calf right off of that mama calf. Uh, when you took a look at the number of worm, different species of worms that were in these animals at necropsy, we killed these animals so we could tell how, how well it did for the worms. We, and the controls had 40 diff 47 different infections. The normectin had 28 different infections. Cytactin injectable, 19 different infections. Cytate and poron 11. So we did see that, you know, as you get away from generics, you do get into better efficacy when we looked at the number of species that were still available post treatment. So we did see that. And this, I think, is the next to the last study we did. We did a study with, with, with the Harris Cattle Company out of, out of uh, California. They used Cydec, you know, Normectin injectable there on calves coming in. They, they treated the animals in, where was that? Right in the middle of California. Uh, it's a it's highly smog covered area where they grow a whole bunch of. Right over the mountains. Yeah, yeah, they grow a whole bunch of what kind of vine? Do they, almond trees? It's almond capital of the world. Somebody, 
Well, they, that's where they had their feed yard. So they used, they used normectin injectable there. It worked only 48% efficacy for the Haemonchus, 30% efficacy for the Ostatagia, 0% efficacy for the Gruperia. So they could have done pretty much as, as well with water as they did with the, with the injectable generic. But the other thing I should say is that the injectable generic was the only drug in the study. So we can't compare it to how well other drugs would have worked. Other drugs might have fallen on their faces also. But for sure, the one they were using was not working. Now this, this, this kind of summarizes what your animals have relative to their age and the worms that they have in them. They start off at zero. When, they, when they're born, they don't have anything. Thankfully for that. You know, Dogs are born with worms. People can be born with worms. Pigs can be born with worms. But thankfully, calves cannot be born with worms. But by the time they're one year of age, they have a whole bunch of Cuperia, Ostagia, Haemonchus, Txi, Esophagus, Nerodirus. They're loaded with every worm they're going to get. And after about one year of age, they lose that thread neck worm, and it disappears. And then the most resistant worm there is to the macrocytic lactones, by the time they're three years of age, they don't have that worm in them anymore. So resistance relative to the macrocytic lactones, adult animals, it's not that big of a factor. Because the most resistant worm, Cuperia, is not in the cows anymore. Having said that, we do have this worm, Haemonchus, still in our adult cows. And we still have our Ostatagia in those adult cows. And we still have nodular worm in those adult cows. So even though we've missed, we've lost the most important resistant worm, we still have three other worms that can be resistant in our adult animal. Okay? That's a little shaker there. So when we look at the worms that are there and translate that into how well drugs work, right off of the cow, all the drugs work pretty good. Okay, except for, well, let's, let's get down to the bottom lines first. If you're going to administer a drug poorly, I don't care how good the drug is, you're going to get close to no efficacy. Okay, so you can buy the best Cadillac at the showroom, drive it into a wall, it's worthless for you. Same thing here. You can take the best product, you don't use it well, it ain't going to work. So that's the bottom line. The next line is this line here, the white dewormers against inhibited worms. There is no efficacy there. That's really important in the summer in Arkansas. Okay, real important. That's the white dewormers. Now let's look at the other ramifications here. For the macrocytic lactone, ivermectin, eprinomectin, doramectin, as you get to about a year of age, you wean that calf off and it shares resistant worms with other resistant worms, those drugs are at the lowest amount of efficacy they're ever going to have. And then those animals lose most of those worms, and your efficacy goes back up again. Okay, Cydectin has a depression in efficacy once you get to that stalker level, but once you get past that stalker level of age, the efficacy is resumed. When you use the benzimidazoles against active worms, they all work well. But against inactive worms, they don't work well at all. Okay, so that's that line. If you use combinations, that's the best you're going to do. You have the macrocytic lactones for all the inhibited stages and for a bunch of other worms. You have the white dewormer for the active worms that are resistant to the macrocytic lactones. So the combination of those two will give you the best efficacy. Okay, that's what I recommend at the stalker level of production. Okay, future for the for the matocytes, new drugs coming out there. More long-acting formulations of macrocytic lactones? I don't know. That, we've got to put that on the shelf. We have to see how well that aprinomectin long-range works. Okay? If, if it falls on its face after a couple of years, I'll bet you there's not going to be any other new macrocytic lactone long-ranges coming out there. So that's, that's still at the jury. This drug, we've looked at it in small ruminants in the United States. It's available for small ruminants in New Zealand and Australia. But something is wrong that's not getting through our FDA. Either, either Novartis is not submitted to the FDA, or, or the FDA doesn't like what it's looking at. But it's a good product, but it's just not seeing the light of day in the United States. That's Monty Panthel. 
Hopefully it's going to come out for our small ruminants, for sure. Hopefully it comes out for you because it's fantastic. Emodepside, it's out in dogs and cats. It's probably too expensive to come out for cattle. But it's a pretty good product. Uh, Derquantil is a new product used for worms, in, again, Australia, New Zealand, and also in Europe. But two years after it came out, there's resistance to it. There is nothing on the horizon that looks as good as ivermectin did that back in the 1980s. Nothing. You know, it's a cruel world. Uh, combinations, we might see an old drug put together with an old drug. There's some of that overseas. It hasn't come out in the United States yet. A new drug with an old drug. The best thing we could ever get for worm is a new product, a new molecule combined with another new molecule. The statisticians say that there's no way you're going to get resistant populations of worms when you have two new products, each of them over 90% efficacy. efficacy. You're not going to get resistant. So that would be the best. But we've gone 30 years. We haven't come up with one new molecule yet. So what are the chances of somebody coming out with two new molecules at one time? Ain't going to happen. But that would be the best case scenario. Vaccines for worms won't ever work. Cattle are hyperimmune to worms. And they get worms every day. The immunity just doesn't get to the worm. Predaceous fungi. This could be available in the United States in the foreseeable future for small ruminants and for horses. Fungi that live on those larvae that are living in that pasture, it's being used overseas, highly efficacious. The kicker here is it might have to get through the F EPA. And EPA is probably worse than the FDA to get things through. The predaceous fungi, nutraceuticals feeding tannins, tannin rich foods, ain't gonna work. Ain't gonna work in cattle. Goats and sheep, they can, they can wave to some success. That ain't gonna happen in cattle. Biologicals, natural controls, ain't gonna happen. Something I don't know about, hopefully. Hopefully I'm out of the loop. I don't know what's new coming up. Uh, general suggestions, I've already gone through all of that. Let me go to the bottom here. Fecal A count reduction test. You use a dewormer, see if the money you spend on that thing is working. Do a fecal sample when you treat. When you treat well, you weigh the animal and you measure your product, okay? Take a fecal sample from that animal. Bring that same animal up in 14 days, the same animal, fecal sample lit, have those two A counts done. Probably you want to do at least 10 animals on your operation and see if you're getting at least a 90% A count reduction. If you're not getting 90% A count reduction, you're not getting 50% worm reduction. So that's what I recommend. We don't want to go here, and that's where we're going. Drugs are getting that bad. Have to go through sheep and goat operations, see which animals are most anemic, and just treat them. If they can run away from you, leave them alone. Okay, drugs are that bad in sheep and goats. We use medications on our sheep and goats at the university. We use triple combinations, labamazole, macrocytic lactone, benzimidazole, double the dose of each, and we still have plenty of worms coming through. And that's, that's where we're going in cattle. Not ne nearly as bad, but we're on that road. Don't want to go there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.